today. The Division of Education, Innovation and Energy is pleased that you are joining us for yet another e-learning program. I'm Lenetta Corey clark and I'm back with you with another series on biology. This one we're looking at ecology. So today, we would explain how biological classification is organized, explain various term invol terms involved in ecology, state and explain various collecting and sampling methods and discuss the importance or the impact of abiotic factors on the environment. Now, what do you call this fruit? Now, I was curious as to what this fruit is called in other countries, so I went on social media and asked. And these are some of my feedbacks. In Barbados, it's called Aki. In Grenada, it's called Skin Up. In Trinidad, it's called Chenet. In Tobago, one person said it's called Kennep, and in Jamaica, they call it Guinip. Different countries are calling this fruit by different names. So how do we as scientists standardize names for different organisms? That is where classification comes in. Classification is separation of living things into groups based on specific characteristics. Scientists love to classify things. It helps us sort things out and it helps us prevent the unfortunate incident of one organism having many scientific names. So the system that is used is one where we have seven subdivisions. So we start with domain, which involves or includes all living things, and then each subcategory is divided based on different characteristics. So, I normally teach my students an acronym to help them remember the order in which this group or this classification is taken in. So if we use the first letter for each word, we have keep people close or forever go single. That's to help you remember the order in which these sub subcategories or subdivisions are placed. So let us look at each subdivision. Like I said, your domain contains all your living organisms. Under kingdom, we separate it into plant or animal. So either a plant or an animal. So this kingdom includes all the plants and all the animals that we know of. Then we can further subdivide. So if we take only the animals, and separate into the different phyla, we have vertebrates, those are animals with backbone. We have your worms, which are segmented, those are called annelids. Then we have your soft segmented organisms, those would be called your mollusks. That will be like your snails, your um, squids, your octopus. Then we also have your arthropods, which would include all of your insects and your centipedes, millipedes, um, crabs, all your crustaceans, basically. Then we can further subdivide. So if we take only the vertebrates, and subdivide them into different classes, we have mammals, birds, fish, amphibians, and your reptiles. And we can continue subdividing until we have one specific organism, and that will be given the denotation of species. So your species have a binomial system. That is 
it's a two-part name, and that would be a specific species scientific name. So, for example, man's scientific name is Homo sapien. So let's look at this classification chart to help you understand. For example, if the domain is um, animals or living things with a nucleus, then it would include all of these, for example, wolf, jackal, fox, cat, rabbits, etc. If we remove all the plants, then the next subcategory is animals. So you will see that the plant has been removed and all we are left with is all the animals in the next category. Similarly, if we go up another grade, if we want to just isolate the chordates or those vertebrates, then in this category or in this level, all the insects will now be removed. So we have all the animals with a backbone in this category. And then we subdivide further. So we want to look at only the animals which are mammals. So in this level, we would have removed fish. So there's no fish here because fish are not mammals. And so we continue breaking it down until you end up with one specific species. And that here is the dog. And here is the species name for that particular dog. So you can see that this dog contains characteristics similar to wolves. But there is one major difference between the wolf and the dog. So here we have a picture of a popular place in Tobago. I'll give you two seconds to see if you can figure out where that place is as we continue talking about ecology and looking at ecological terms that you need to be familiar with. So the first term you need to learn is biotic factor. Bio denotes living. So biotic factors are all the living things or the living components of your ecosystem. So what are the living components or what are the biotic factors in this picture? We have the grass. We have trees. Believe it or not, these white specks are birds. I know for a fact that in this water course we have caiman. So that would be a biotic factor. We have vines around the trees. So your biotic factors are all the living components of the ecosystem. Your abiotic factors are the opposite, all the non-living components in that environment. So let us stay with the biotic factors for a little while. We have met this word before. So species. So a species is one specific organism or a group of organisms that have the same characteristics. They're able to interbreed and create a viable offspring. So for example, we have this cock. So this is one species of birds. A population is a group of organisms which are similar living in the same environment. So here we have a population of hens. Continue with the terminologies, community. So a community is a group of different species. So they must be different. And they're all living together and interacting together. So here we have a population of scarlet ibis, species of monkey. We have a species of frogs. We have different kinds of plants. So here we have a community of different species made up of several populations, and they are interacting with each other. So that is community. Another term you need to be familiar with is the word A habitat is the place where an organism lives. 
So obviously, if it is living there, it is going to engage in all the characteristics of all living things. It's going to feed, it's going to grow, it's going to reproduce in its own habitat. Now, we have two different habitats. We have terrestrial and we have aquatic. And of course, as biologists, you know, we love to classify. So we have subcategories of terrestrial habitats and aquatic habitats. So we have two main types of terrestrial habitats. We have arboreal, which would be all the organisms found on trees, including trees as well, or other plants. And we have e Daphic, which would be organisms found in and around the soil. On the aquatic, of course, we have marine, which would be your sea-based organisms, and of course, we have fresh water. So your salt water and your fresh water aquatic environments or habitat. I'd like you to take a minute now to determine what type of habitat is being shown in the diagram. And if you said fresh water, you are correct. What about this? What type of habitat is this? Yes, it's a terrestrial habitat. And here we have sand. So we know that this habitat is going to naturally lead into some sort of marine habitat or environment. What about this one? Yes, this is terrestrial, and because you're seeing so many trees, it's edaphic as well. Okay, a niche. A niche is the specific role of an organism in its environment. Now, the niche is determined by the resources that the habitat has to provide for the organism and its activity, whether it comes out to feed in the day or it feeds in the night, for example, as well as the makeup of the habitat. Is it a dry area? It is a, is it a um, sandy area? Does it have moisture? So all of that will determine the niche or the role that that specific organism plays in its environment. And everyone's niche is very specific. For example, we all know about this household friend called the wood slave. The wood slave will normally be found in your ceilings or roof areas. And what do they do? They eat the, or they prey on your insects that are found in the house. Now, there's also another organism that does the same thing in your home, and that would be like your spiders. Now, what separates the niche of the wood slave from that of the spiders may be the type of organisms that they eat. So your wood slave may prey mainly on your crawling insects, while your spiders are fond of more the flying insects. And also the wood slave and the spiders may feed at different times. So your wood slave has its own niche, while the spiders have its own niche. No two organisms can have the same niche in the exact same environment. We are going to have competition, and one organism must survive over the other one. In order to study the environment, biologists normally have to collect or sample materials, whether it be animal or plant. And why do we sample or collect? For many reasons, but include classification so we can know what they are and understand them better, also to estimate population. So one method that is used to help estimate population is called a quad rat. So your quadrat would have to be of known dimension. So for example, let us say that this quadrat is 25 centimeters by 25 centimeters. And 
you have to determine the area under investigation. So let us assume it is a football field. So what you will do is throw your quadrant randomly to different areas, and you are going to count the number of species that you're investigating. So for example, if we are looking at this dandelion here, when we throw the quadrant, we are now going to count how many dandelions we are seeing in this quadrant. And we will repeat that several times and then use a simple mathematical calculation to determine population density of that particular species. So we, here we have some students who are investigating um, seedling density of the manchineal tree in a beach area in Tobago. So tell me, what do you think might be an issue with the use of Quadrat? Although it is an excellent tool, it has its shortcomings. Yes, of course. What if the organism is mobile? Like these. We can't use a Quadrat here because they are going to walk off or crawl away from your Quadrat. So, in these cases, when we have insects to investigate and they are small, we tend to use something called a Hooter. And you can make your own putter at home. It's not anything fancy. You just need a simple jar with a lid. And you use either straws or tubes. Insert them into the lid. And then you would suck on one end. And the suction is going to create enough force to pull the insect into the straws and into the jar. Now, of course, you will put a piece of cloth or muslin around the base of the straw you're pulling on to prevent the insect from going into your mouth. But it's an excellent way of collecting small insects on leaves, on tree roots or tree barks, on buildings, and you can determine population density, you can determine species name, etc., from this simple putter. But what about if they're flying. We can't use a putter, and we definitely can't use a quadrat. In that case, we would use, yes, sweeping nets or butterfly nets. Sometimes we don't necessarily need to remove the organism from the environment to study them. So for example, if we just want to determine population size, we can use the capture, release, and recapture method. This method is very simple. You let us use this example where we want to determine the population of these goldfish in a lake. So on day one, you will catch some of the fish and you will tag them. So here you see green tags on all of the fish with, that, that were captured on the first day. You release them back into their environment and after a determined time, it may be two days, it may be a week, depending on the organism that you're studying, you go and you recapture some organisms from the same environment. You count how many organisms you capture, and you also record how many of them have the tag which were placed in the first incident. And then you use a simple formula here, and you will calculate the population of that particular organism. Now, when you tag a, a, an organism, you have to ensure that the tagging doesn't interfere with their ability to return to their environment. It doesn't prevent them from finding food, doesn't prevent them from finding a mate. So you will, for example, for turtles, we tag them on their ears. For birds, we tag them on their feet and we release them. And hopefully they're able to reintegrate with their population without any problems. So finally, Let's come back to this ecosystem. I asked you if you knew where this picture was taken. Yes, it was taken by the man-made lake in lowlands. So we have dealt with biotic factors. Those are your living components of the environment. So let's look at the abiotic factors now. Remember, abiotic are your, your non-living components of the environment. So take two seconds to see if you can determine four different non-living components in this image. So the first 
type of abiotic component is soil. What do soils contain? Soils contain nutrients, which are necessary for plant development. Soil also contains water, which plants use for photosynthesis. Soil also contains oxygen for your invertebrates and other organisms that live within the soil. Another abiotic factor is air, a very important component because air contains oxygen that we need to breathe and it also contains carbon dioxide that the plants use for photosynthesis. Plants also use the oxygen when they respire. Next, we have light. Light is an abiotic factor. It is non-living. Light provides an essential component for plants to photosynthesize. Light is necessary for us to see. Temperature. Any changes in temperature is going to affect how effective an organism is able to operate in its environment. So any changes up or down affects how an, how an organism is able to find a mate, find food, and basically survive. So control of temperature is very important, and temperature is, of course, another abiotic factor. Finally, we have water. Now, of course, we know we need water for drinking, for bathing, for doing a lot of processes. Water is also a habitat for many organisms. All of our fish, um, we have crabs, and you can think of many other organisms which actually live in water. So water is a very important component for the, in the environment, a very important abiotic factor. We also, plants also need water for photosynthesis. So let us review. What have we done? We did explain biological classification. Remember, keep people close or forever go single. We explained various terminologies like abiotic, biotic. We explained species, population, community. We looked at various collecting and sampling methods, quadrat, puta, um, sweeping nets, for example. Re capture, release, and recapture method. And then we discuss how important or abiotic factors are in the environment. So as you go, I would like you to look at this small video showing different environments around Tobago. See if you can determine where these places are. And as you go, I thank you for paying attention. And please do stay safe and enjoy the rest of the series, which are going to be coming up shortly.